when we went into Busia, African leafy vegetables were considered food for the poor, albeit the fact that they are highly nutritious. After generating data to show that they are actually of high nutritional value, then we use that data to teach people in Busia and to teach people at policy level. Hello and welcome to the Power of the Public Plate podcast, brought to you by ICLE, Local Governments for Sustainability, and the UN One Planet Network, with your host, myself, Josephine Hinz, based in ICLE's Berlin office, responsible for global initiatives of sustainable, innovative, and circular procurement. And I'm Peter Francesci, running ICLE's Brussels office and global food program. ICLE is a European and global network of local and regional governments committed to integrated, sustainable development. And the UN One Planet Network works as a multi-stakeholder community across six programs, one of which is committed to the implementation of sustainable public procurement globally. In this podcast, we explore the stories of champions of food procurement around the world. In each episode, we bring you insightful and inspiring stories of how the public sector can influence the food value chain by leveraging its purchasing power. Join us as we talk to public sector staff, policy advisors, and experts to learn how to support smallholder farmers, serve healthy and nutritious meals, source locally and climate friendly. In this episode, we travel to Busia County in Kenya to talk to Victor Vasike. Victor is the Deputy Institute Director of the Genetic Resources Research Institute of the Kenya Agricultural and Livestock Research Organization. He has 33 years of experience in research and management in the private and public sector agricultural research. And Victor coordinated the implementation of a pilot study which successfully led to supplying indigenous vegetables to schools and hospitals. Indeed, in this episode we talk about school food procurement, healthy, nutritious school meals. And we will get to know what the key challenges were and how Victor and his team were able to overcome them, really creating a community of practice, bringing together farmers, cooks, heads of schools, even the school children and the local communities. You will hear how you can create true sustainable and healthy food procurement, a deal for the school and the budget, a deal for the children and a deal for the farmer. And now we bring you Victor Vasike. A warm welcome to you, Victor. Thank you for joining us today for the Power of the Public Plate podcast. We are very delighted to, to have you and to talk about your valuable work in Busia County. And um, yeah, it's really a pleasure to, to um, dive into all, all, the, all the amazing projects that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I also feel privileged to be hosted by you to talk about the work that we undertook with a number of partners in Busia County in Kenya and hope that um, other people can benefit from our experiences uh, if they can um, sort of take that as best practice in terms of um, getting indigenous vegetable value chain into public procurement. I want to ask you really, to take a step back and explain to us what were the specific issues that created the opportunity for most kind of sustainable perspective on procuring food items? Um, in Kenya, first of all, um, uh, the nutrition situation is, is quite bad. One in every five children is uh, malnourished. Uh, the level of malnourishment in Busia was quite high, about 23 to 25%. And that, that made us look for alternatives. And with the implementation of financial support by FAO, by Jeff, by Australian Center for International Agricultural Research, we went into Busia to look at how we can get indigenous African vegetables into public procurement, particularly in school situation. And uh, we realized that on the one hand, uh, we have a lot of diversity of indigenous vegetables. On the other hand, the malnutrition levels are going up. 
and we sought to intervene this by introducing African indigenous vegetables into the food plate of the students of one school called Mundika High School. And uh, we did this by, first of all, uh, through the support, as I said, of uh, FAO, Jeff, SER, and with the implementation support from Biovacity International, we identified a number of groups that had that diversity on farms. And then we also looked at opportunities in schools where there was need for feeding kids or feeding students on high nutrition indigenous vegetables. So we started by bringing them the two groups from the supply side, those are the farmer groups, and from the demand side, the schools in this case, we brought them together to identify together uh, what the issues would be. And uh, we first of all had the supply side, the farmers talk about the issues, what are the issues the supply side, and among the things they said was that we can grow indigenous African vegetables, we know how to do it, we know what they are, but the problem is who buys them? The problem was the market, from what they see, they know how to grow it, they know what, what species they have been eating, on the demand side, there was a problem. The problem was, where are these indigenous vegetables? Um, who supplies them? And in what quantities and quality? Can they do consistent supply? And what are they anyway? So the project I was coordinating in Kenya called the BFN, Biodiversity, Biodiversity for Food and Nutrition Project, uh, undertook an activity to um, analyze the nutritional value of a range of indigenous vegetables being grown in the gardens. And we found out that these indigenous vegetables were of very high nutritional value. They were able to, they were able to supply the much needed nutrients that are needed nutritionally by the community as well as the schools. Uh, just to just to pause here for a moment, um, can you give us some examples of these indigenous vegetables just to get a better understanding of, of what they are? The indigenous African uh, vegetables that are grown in that environment, uh, there are diverse types even at the species level, where the cowpeas, for instance, the amaranth, for instance, the spider plant, the Ethiopian kale, the jute mallow, the African nightshade, as well as the slender leaf. So about a range of about seven indigenous African vegetables. So after the analysis, we realized, for instance, that the amaranth has very high iron compared to the cabbages that are fed to students. And when you talk about malnutrition in Kenya, you're looking at iron, you're looking at zinc, you're looking at vitamin A, and of course, uh, iron and zinc are found in relatively large amounts in African living vegetables compared to the cabbages that are already in the public procurement system at the school side. So these are the vegetables we now began to uh, advance into the school system. One, um, in Kenya, the school has a decentralized uh, procurement system, or rather the procurement system in Kenya is decentralized. Schools are able to advertise for tenders and attract people who can supply the various commodities on condition that A, they are registered, the providers or suppliers are registered, they observe labor laws, they have the financial capacity, and they can make sure that there is consistency. These in African indigenous vegetables were not in the procurement system because first the farmers were producing in little amounts. And the reason why they were doing that was because they didn't know where to sell, so they were just producing minimum amounts. So essentially, it was really about kind of a, a lack of, of awareness and, and a lack of connection and kind of knowledge on, on how to access the public sector market. So you kind of started by creating a dialogue. Is that Was that kind of the, the first step? Yes, uh, that was it. And, and that made us uh, call for, hold a workshop where we brought the, the demand side, which are the schools, and the supplies are the pharma groups. And first of all, the question we ask both sides is, what is the problem? Do you know how to grow African leafy vegetables? Yes, they said we do. Uh, do you know how to prepare them? Yes, we know how to prepare them. 
Do you know where you can sell these African vegetables? No, we don't. Uh, have you ever tried to sell them to any of the markets, like the schools, the, the mass feeding programs, wherever they may be? No. We looked at the school side, the demand side. Would you want the African leaf vegetables? First of all, do you know they have high nutritional value? Now we know because you have given us the information after having done nutrition analysis. We had that information. And we're giving talks to the school. We said, yes, now we know the value of this. These are the cabbages that we normally buy for the kids. Now that you know you can feed this to your school children, would you be willing to buy? And they said, yes, as long as we know who is planting this and is ready to sell in amounts that we need. Because if you are going to go into a, a system where you are buying and selling at a school level into a, in a procurement system, then you need to have consistent supply. The suppliers must be consistent in amounts that the schools are going to need. And because schools, kids are going to be told every so often you are going to eat indigenous vegetables, you have to be sure that the supply is there. What else are you able to do? We are able to negotiate on an agreed price and also negotiate on an agreed quality. And secondly, what do you have the expertise to cook these indigenous vegetables? They said no. So we told them, what you will do, because you're working with the, um, the Minister of Agriculture, who have got home science officer, we'll train the officers and we'll get the officers to come to the school kitchen to help the people to help the cookers, the cooks there, on how preparation is done. Because as we know, these indigenous vegetables are dense in nutrition, but if you cook them badly, you lose the very nutrition that you're going to need. So you have to only cook them in such a way that you make these nutrients available. I, I want to kind of pause here for a moment to, to kind of dive deeper into the um because it's it's a new it's another group that has to be included right the the, the kitchen staff has to be included and, and trained do you leverage that through the procurement process as well or is that kind of a bit separate from from the tender work no that was uh, to in, to initiate or stimulate demand what the farmers remember were not uh, producing this in large amounts because they didn't know the market now we have brought them together with the schools, where the schools are now going to act as a market. And these schools need also to be capacity built. So we capacity build the schools by helping them get somebody who can teach the teachers on how to cook, prepare these indigenous African vegetables. So that's, that's not a separate thing. It was like a process. OK? So once that was done, and with the information of uh, nutrition analysis that we had done, they were now ready. They were now ready to demand volumes of indigenous African vegetables. That was just to stimulate demand from the demand side. Victor, could I ask you also a question regarding uh, the, the procurement process? I understand the different the challenges about the availability of the vegetables about the, the, the supply, uh, the logistics around it. But I wonder how does the procurement process work? And I understand that uh, you basically did an assessment also about the, the availability and, and, and the farmers. But then who has the mandate in uh, Busia about the procurement? Is it the local government? Is it the regional? Is it the national government? Is it centralized? Could you tell us a bit about how this is structured to have a better idea. Okay, procurement system in Kenya is decentralized. Used to be centralized before. What used to happen is that the government would uh, procure all the materials needed by the various stakeholders. And then the various entities will acquire this from a central place, the central stores. But that wasn't working because of uh, the distances to the various places where these materials would be needed. So they decentralized that. So each school, or each school or each entity can procure materials, food, or whatever, or services in their locality as long as they conform 
through the procedures and process of the Public Procurement and Disposal Act. And Public and Procurement Disposal Act basically just means that if you are going to be procuring goods or services, you need to be a pre-qualified. In pre-qualification, they look at a number of things. One, your financial capacity to supply a certain good to a certain entity. They also look at the fact that uh, are you registered? Are you observing labor laws? So those are some of the things that these entities, whether they are schools or whether they are hospitals or whether they are government entities of whatever nature, have to fulfill before you get into a procurement system. One. So the school that we worked with in this case, uh, the farmer groups were not pre-qualified. So what we did as, as a project is to allow them to capacity build them to pre-qualify first of all as an entity as a farmer group as a cbo it was a cbo called singi and singi cbo uh, is an umbrella organization that has about 50 groups farmer groups so one of the farmer groups under singi cbo is the one that we capacity build to be able to supply meaning we capacity build them in how to apply for a tender, how to meet the minimum standards such as uh, observing the labor laws, how they are to be registered, to have the financial capacity. But the financial capacity was small, but I'll explain that in a while. So we had them pre-qualified, step one, pre-qualified. And then secondly, link them to a market, which initially, remember, in our, in our background studies we found that they had indicated they didn't know or even have the capacity to meet the market demand. So build the capacity to apply and qualify to supply indigenous vegetables to schools at a pre-agreed negotiated price, at a certain quality standard. Because if you are going to supply indigenous vegetables, you probably can pull out one vegetable plus the roots. Are you going to add value by removing the dirt, by washing it, by picking the leaves only and leaving the stems? Or are you going to supply these vegetables directly after picking and supplying to the school and measuring the kilos? Thank you. Uh, I want to ask you kind of how many farmers are we talking about in this pilot? procurement project and I would be really interested to learn more about how for instance a meal looks now in this in the school compared to before you um, work together with the farmers and to to create kind of the indigenous kind of supply chain of, of vegetables. Singi is a, an, a CBO community-based organization called Singi, S-I-N-G-I as a community-based organization, it, it, it has an organizational structure where they have got a chairman, secretary, and a treasurer. Under Singi CBO in Busia, it has uh, a membership of 50 smaller groups. So 50 smaller groups forming one umbrella organization called Singi. Now, each of these smaller groups or farmer groups was comprising 25 members. They vary, they vary from place to place, but the one that we worked with to link to Mundika High School was comprising 25 farmers. So what happened is uh, these 25 farmers were producing indigenous vegetables, first of all in the school compound, but later on when the demand increased, they also started producing on their own individual farms. Now, the demand side, the school. The school, Mundika High School, has a population of 500. And they needed vegetables to be uh, they needed vegetables to be cooked for these 500 students, and they figured because of nutritional issues they wanted to feed this on high nutrition indigenous African vegetables. So what we did is the school said we would like to do this because we want our children's health to improve. So we'll provide land on the school compound. So the school had about 100 acres. So they provided a piece of land, separate piece of land on the school compound to make sure and interest these farmers to produce these vegetables on school compound and negotiate the price because they were offering the school land 
so that these pharma groups can supply to the kitchen consistently. So the pharma groups will work on this school land as a group, and depending on who gave in how much labor, their management, as I said, they were organized, they were managers and treasurers and things, made sure that for, for them to share the profit, then they'll have to have develop a schedule of working on these indigenous vegetables to produce them and to supply them to the school. So I understand it right that the farmers, they collaborated on the same piece of land and then shared, uh, let's say, the, the profits gained from that? Yes, exactly. They, 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 they came together and the school provided a piece of land for them to produce these seven indigenous vegetable types. And then the profit will be shared depending on who provided how much labor. And there was a record kept on who was providing how much land at the end of the season. Yeah, that must be quite some motivation to, to kind of see uh, how the others, how much the others are doing. And yeah, I'm, I'm wondering, since you mentioned it's school land, right? Is it linked then to educational efforts how do you how do you bring in the next generation kind of the students into how the food is actually grown yes this was a school situation uh, may i talk a little bit about the, the kids and their preferences first of all african indigenous vegetables is considered vegetable for the poor traditional uh, and unless you cook these african indigenous vegetables properly you will not like the taste so there were test preferences then there were perception preferences but how did we change that? We changed it by, remember I said we started by analyzing the nutritional content of the African indigenous vegetable types in terms of the nutritional elements, the zinc and iron that you need, and juxtaposing that one with the cabbage that was already in the system, the procurement system, because cabbage has grown on a large scale. So you compare, you provide data on the one side data, zinc data, iron data, and uh, other related food value data on cabbage and Afri the individual African leaf vegetables, the cowpeas, the amaranth, the spider plant, and so forth, and point out the differences in the iron, the differences in the zinc, and link all that information, background information, on cognitive value that zinc plays a part in terms of improving your health and therefore not getting these opportunistic diseases and also bringing, building up your brain power. Once people see that link between nutrition and students see that link between nutrition and health and performance, then that is a motivation for them to change their perception but also to begin to eat. It may not taste like meat, but they now know that eating this African indigenous vegetable provides much better nutrients than the cabbages that we are being fed on. So we change their perception that way. Previously, we had an experience in the same school from the school matron, the person that looks after their health, that there were many cases of opportunistic diseases, the colds, when there's cold weather, the people didn't have robust systems, health systems, to be able to withstand some of these extremistic diseases. And there were also some students that were not eating meat because of various body challenges. So these are the students that now opted at first to eat indigenous vegetables, plus also the teachers. Actually, that's where we started, the teachers first. Because the teachers knew what they were going to get from these indigenous vegetables. Now, the interesting thing is the kids were watching what the teachers were eating. In this country, what teachers, teachers are role models. So what teachers were eating was considered to be something good. And what a few of the students who not eat meat were eating was slowly being looked at as people eating food just like the teachers who are role models. Then before we knew it, the number of students that now say they were also sick and not able to eat meat began to increase so that they access the African leafy vegetables. That's how the trajectory went. That slowly we found people who are in quotes now behaving sick in order to access African indigenous vegetables 
because of the data that we had given. That in itself now stimulated demand on the school side to access the African lead vegetables. This is uh, very interesting to understand how you apply behavioral change through role modeling, but also by on a cognitive rational level telling them you eat this, you get uh, better vitamins and, and, and so on. I have one question. So, but does that mean, is it all plant-based or how often is, you, is there meat in the meal? That's one question. And the other question is also related uh, to the food preparation. That was also very interesting about the nutritional value. So I was wondering, talking about the, the social impact of, uh, of sustainable food procurement. So on one hand, the procurement includes the purchasing of the food. And on the other hand, it's also about uh, hiring the people who cook it at school, right? Because it's it's prepared at school and it's about the uh, uh, cooks and kitchen staff being trained to cook uh, the vegetables and the fruits in a way that the nutritional value is kept. Yes, um, the number of days that uh, the school kitchen was applying meat to students was once a week, not every day, it was once a week. So once a week, uh, when other students were eating meat, there was a small group of students that were not eating meat because of their health issues. So the African indigenous vegetables came in to fill that gap. While the rest of the group is going to eat meat, this group was going to eat African vegetables. Now, how did we make sure that the African leaf vegetables are appealing to the palate? By we had remember this is just a small part of a larger project called Biodiversity Food and Nutrition. One of the key aspects of this bigger project for which I was a national coordinator, the BFN project, we had three components. Component one was generating data on biodiversity that's used at home for, for improved human welfare. So data generation involved data analysis on nutritional value of this indigenous vegetable. So we had that data. Okay. Then on the other side, uh, we were to outscale the use of biodiversity. We were holding public fora where we were raising awareness about the value of indigenous African vegetables. When you raise that awareness, if you have got data to prove that indeed the African leaf vegetables are superior in terms of micronutrients compared to cabbages and kale, which is the commonest vegetable that is sold to hospitals, sold to schools, and sold to other places. The other thing now was preparation is important. We're working with a bunch of nutritionists from the Ministry of Health who said, if you're going to cook it badly, overcook the indigenous vegetables, you make the micronutrients, the zinc and the iron that you so much need in the food, you make them unavailable. So what you do is cooking becomes important. But we have been uh, training the wider public in Busia County and raising awareness and uh, looking at the market issues about indigenous African vegetables. And then when it now came to one school that we wanted to pilot, because it was a pilot project, we said, okay, fine. Why can't we, for instance, if we want to attack the issue of malnutrition among kids and the vulnerable ones are the kids that are in school that will eventually influence their parents at home and change their perception of indigenous vegetables, not just being for the sick and elderly, but for everybody to raise nutrition. I also wanted to, to ask just to get the, the, the full picture about the, the school meal and this, uh, the school nutrition uh, system there and what procurement involves. Now I understand uh, it's about the farmers, it's about the kitchen staff, and, but the meals themselves, when, you, when we talk about school meals, is it about one warm meal during the day? Is it also about a meal in the morning or later? What, what does it involve? In 12 hours, um, from say morning 8 o'clock, let, let's begin 6 o'clock, they'll have access to breakfast. And breakfast in most schools involves some tea, some bread, one or two slices of bread, and some tea. And in this tea there will be milk and sugar. Then at lunchtime, one o'clock, they'll have ugali, a 
paste that you put maize flour and then turn it and stir it until it comes to a thick paste and that is eaten in general we call it ugali and it's the commonest form of food among kenyans so that paste you can eat that ugali with meat or with vegetables that's a starch basically and then you need a vegetable we don't usually in schools provide fruits it's too expensive so you'll have that for lunch for dinner you'll either keep it that way or you'll change it to uh, maize and beans that are cooked together and with some soup and oil in there for dinner then you'll interchange that the next day to have either maize and beans at lunch hour and then ugali and vegetables or meat once a week in this case for lunch and then breakfast remains pretty much the same so you can have also breakfast not just tea but you can have some we call it uji which is now a lighter form of ugali you get water bring it to boiling and then add some plants tie it becomes not a thick paste but a um, sort of a lighter paste so that would be breakfast and then these vegetables or meat will be for lunch and dinner or yeah, can change to maize and beans. I would like to ask you a bit more about a completely other um, lens we could look at this project. So you mentioned we, we talked about the nutritional benefit. We talked about the local employment and local kind of economic development benefits. However, I mean, you're also working in, in kind of biodiversity, right? And, and I'm kind of wondering, what is the role of this sustainable public food procurement in the context of planetary health or let's say ecosystem health? How important is it to kind of farm this diversity of indigenous vegetables for the environmental kind of um, context in, in Busia? As a project, we are looking at sustainable production of different species or different types, different species of the same crop. If you look at amaranth in Busia, you'll have different types. There are some, and they, are, they come across as different colors anyway. So we're promoting biodiversity in, that's the main project, promotion of biodiversity for improved human health and nutrition. That was the title of the entire project. So what we did was we recognized that there is so much diversity there, but against this diversity in Busia, there is so much malnutrition. Why? That was a big question, project question. Against the background of so much diversity in terms of plants and animals, why are we having so many malnourished people? And one of the reason, one of the quick reasons we came up with is perhaps they are not aware even about the fact that just behind their backyard, in their school, in their gardens, home gardens, they have got answers to their malnutrition issues. That's one. So what we needed to do is first of all get the data to influence policy. And we did use that data to influence policy that helped us to develop the first biodiversity policy ever done in any of the 47 counties in Kenya. We did a biodiversity policy supported by this project. Secondly, we thought, look, if we are going again to get these um, vegetables into schools, schools are also governed, school feeding is governed by certain policies. You cannot just introduce a food into a school whose parents believe that that is food for the poor and they're paying money to get their kids fed. So we must somehow find a way of making sure that it is not considered that the school administration is feeding kids on trash. And to do that, we had to use data. That's why we generated data. Then we decided now we need to raise awareness get people from Busia to bring the diversity kept in on their farms. And we, we had groups coming together one day in a year to display their diversity of not just foods, but even animals, small livestock. And to promote this, we actually gave uh, a prize or a, um, uh, the, the, the group that display the highest level of biodiversity in, food, in, in the foods and all in crops was given a token of appreciation. So they were sort of competing in showing how much biodiversity each of those groups from Busia County 
was keeping and or using. That way, then you teach them the value of biodiversity, either for users, for improved food or in medicine, and they will tell us, we use this to, to manage this sort of challenge, nutritional challenge, or even to, to treat animal diseases. So we collected all this information, and on that background, then began to look at opportunities of how to intervene. And remember, Malnutrition affects mostly the children, either the pregnant women, the elderly, or the children under the age of five. So to target the children under, in schools or under the age of five, went into schools and hospitals, and mothers coming for antenatal care, where they will need to feed their unborn children within the 1,000 days in there. So overall, then we could see at the end of the project, because it lasted six years, but actually, there is a market improvement in terms of in terms of nutrition of people in Busia. But also, more importantly, that the pharma groups, not just this one pharma group that we worked with, other pharma groups, began to approach schools because they had talked about no, they are, they are not being market. Now we told them that you actually can walk to the nearest school to your home and ask the head of that school whether you can supply indigenous African vegetables. And now that you have the information about nutrition, and also we are outscaling this to other schools that people know that we need African indigenous vegetables, there will be sustained demand. And therefore supply is increased and people earn livelihoods from the growing of indigenous African vegetables. That's how it went. Yeah, that's a, that's a massive change and a, and a very kind of big and complex process it sounds like can you perhaps um break down for us how does a tender look like now if a school is purchasing food wh what is different now as compared to before that's a very good question when we went into busia african living vegetables were considered food for the poor albeit the fact that they are highly nutritious after generating data to show that they are actually of high nutritional value, then we use that data to teach people in Russia and to teach people at policy level because we, are involved with, we had a group of, um, of leaders uh, led by heads of department of nutrition, head of education, head of environment, and uh, the Minister for Agriculture. These are the people that actually helped me to develop the biodiversity policy for Busia. So we had to start at that level, making them understand that using indigenous African vegetables has a lot of value. At the end of the day, actually, all this group of top people who are like equivalent of ministers, they were county ministers from the county of Busia. They were the first champions to begin to eat African indigenous vegetables and be happy about it. And therefore, they could support this whole system of getting their kids to eat African indigenous vegetables and also influence from places they came from the value of African indigenous vegetables. And so what happened now, finally, at the procurement at the schools, African living vegetables, as I may have said earlier, that were not part of procurement, right? Because they were not part of procurement, nobody, there was no demand in schools. But having brought the school side together with the farmer groups and teaching them about the value, and making the schools realize that you can actually get farmer groups to grow this in their own farm and aggregate this to be able to supply to the school in quantities that are needed wherever they are needed, and also negotiating a price. And how did we negotiate a price? How did they arrive at a price? Because we did one thing. We did gross margin analysis. How do you arrive at a good price for the school? Because the schools needed it cheap. The farmers needed it expensive. How do you arrive at a negotiated price? We did gross margin analysis. First of all, by farmers alone. What does it take to grow this crop? Land preparation, how much? Cost each of those steps in the growing of the value chain of this indigenous crop. And then get the, the school also, because there are farmers, they grow foods in their own homes anyway. Get the school, the procurement officer, the deputy headmaster, the headmaster himself, and an agriculture teacher to do the gross margin analysis and arrive at a price on at what level should they buy indigenous vegetables from the farmer. 
then bring them all together in a room, which we did, to agree on to do the gross margin analysis together. So when they argue about, no, it costs this to, to plow, it costs this to add fertilizer, fertilizer might cost this, cost this to put some, God knows, organic or inorganic fertilizer, or organic or organic pesticide. At the end of the day, you do the gross margin analysis and you come up with a break-even point. Then they know that they are not going to lose so much money. And this one's from the school side, no very well, that's going to be a good price. Then they get into a contract or they get into a procurement system. But we would also have taught the farmers how to apply and win a tender. This is really an inspiring story. And uh, I would have two questions. On one hand, you mentioned the price. And it's really interesting how you say that the procurer, the demand side, wants to get it cheap and the supply side wants to get it, sell it uh, expensive. But would you say that uh, shifting to indigenous or let's say traditional or, 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 or local vegetables was more cost effective? And then the final question would be the role of procurers within the food value chain is really strong. In terms of prices, first of all, for us to verify whether or not this was working very well, we had to carry out uh, an assessment at the school. And we carried this out from the management of the school. The question we're asking is, economically speaking, you are procuring cabbages and kales before. Now you are procuring indigenous African vegetables. On top of just being nutritious, how is the economics running? He was able to give us actual figures that indicated to us that the putting African indigenous vegetables in the procurement program actually saved money. It saved the schools money. It made the school running a little better because the amount of money coming from government in terms of feeding kids is constant. But they were saving now because the, pro the transport cost A was lessened because you're looking at farmers around your school. The farmers also looked at the school as their own because it provided a market. And they, they were like protecting their own school because you look at it, my kids go to this school. I feed the, my kids on the food I know is high quality. And the schools benefit. On top of the schools benefiting in terms of money saving, I'm also benefiting as a parent and as a farmer because now I've got a market for the African leaf vegetables, which I would otherwise have been feeding to livestock or throwing. And then I can go up to producing it to scale because there's already a demand. And because of this environment we're working on, actually, a lot of other neighboring schools that had initially were very skeptical about this model began to ask us. First, remember, we went to them and invited them to a workshop where we were looking at, do you or do you not want? Now they were asking us to go teach them and to go replicate the same model to their schools. Unfortunately, the time for the project ended, but it's now going on on its own. It is a fire that we lit that now continues to burn in Busia and in neighboring counties. So you save money that way. In terms of the role of procurers in this case, is that they are now able to target, to say, fine, uh, we are able to get this material at this price from this community or from this locality. They are able to, to, to schedule their expenditure uh, in such a way that you are going to buy this and this, this is nutritious to bring to the school garden. And you know, schools are procurement officers. So now the procurement officers know exactly what quality, they know exactly what value, they know exactly what cost these vegetables are going to cost and they can now store but not store, in the indigenous vegetables, once you got them out, cannot store for very long. So they can schedule the supply and demand. They can schedule the supply, we want this this week, we want it the other week, we want it the other week, so that you get them freshly supplied. That way the procurement, the procurement person becomes a very important cog in terms of the food value chain of African indigenous vegetables. Thank you for all this information. What would be your final words of wisdom also toward other procurers or schools who are struggling to, you know, the, 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 the pressure of price, the pressure of supply, the pressure of the legal 
system, the procurement system, or the national policies who may not be so supportive. What would be your final advice and words of wisdom to them? Thank you very much, Peter. The final advice I'll, I'll say at this point is, there are best practices that we have established that seems to work and work well. There is rampant malnutrition, particularly in African countries. And the answers to this malnutrition lie within the food gardens, the school gardens, the home gardens that are laden with high nutrition, vegetables, and crops. Uh, we need to upscale the knowledge. We need to demonstrate to the wider public that this works, but you need data. You are going to need two things, actually. You need data to convince people that this works and works well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Victor, for your final words of wisdom. But the whole story is a lot about wisdom. It's a lot about bringing back a lot to community and everybody gaining because that's we in Europe, we have the, the Green Deal. But I call this also a very good deal because everybody wins. I absolutely agree with you. What you mentioned, it's really this kind of 360 degree kind of perspective also on, on kind of food procurement. And, and I was really impressed by their kind of pragmatic approach and almost having a checklist of talking to everyone who has to be involved and I really identifying the core challenges first before taking any action. So talking to the farmers, they know how to grow the vegetables, they um, etc. But what they lack is this awareness of how to get access to the public sector market. So they solved that. Then the next challenge was really about how to prepare um, the, the food in a way that all the nutrients are being preserved. So they organized training for, for the kitchen staff and incorporated that. So I'm very impressed by the step-by-step -step kind of checklist approach. And so, yeah, kudos to, to Victor and, and his team. Indeed. So very inspiring. And I'm looking forward to the next uh, champion on uh, sustainable food procurement. Absolutely. So if you like this episode, you can kind of support us by sharing it with your colleagues and friends. And to learn more about uh, Victor's work in, in Kenya and Busia County, you can um, check out the episode description. Stay tuned. Thank you so much for listening. Bye-bye. Goodbye, everyone.